We're going to talk today about a report that was published by uh, the Citizen Lab in the uh, International Human Rights Program at the University of Toronto. Um, and so if I could just uh, transition to the first slide here uh, by way of introduction. Today we're going to be talking about some of the major findings in our report and link them to uh, a larger discussion that's already in, in play in Canada and elsewhere around the world regarding the role of uh, law enforcement in, in public society and in public space and, and how controversial technologies can lead to uh, a number of human rights impacts that are on uh, the, the radar and have been on the radar for human rights researchers for quite some time now. Um, and so you see on the slide here just a, a, a quick overview by way of uh, sign, signposting of what some of the topics are that we're going to be uh, discussing today um, for our presentation. Uh, but I just wanted to just uh, uh, focus on the purpose of the report and situate it within a larger context in Canada. Um, I, I, for one, am a criminal defense lawyer in Toronto, uh, and I am also um, involved in a number of pro bono and, and strategic activities relating to human rights in the digital privacy and cybersecurity space through my work at the Citizen Lab, we were mindful as researchers regarding how algorithmic technologies have been deployed by police services. Uh, we knew somewhat that this was happening in Canada, but we certainly had much more information about what is happening on the ground in other countries, such as the United Kingdom and United States. Um, and and it, it appeared from what we knew that, um, it, it, that Police services in those countries seem to have been more public or more quick on the draw in rolling out some of these controversial programs and we set up to find out what is happening in Canada on the ground uh, to the extent that we could find out and what are some of the human rights impacts that would arise in the Canadian justice system which of course has uh, a higher level obligations under international human rights law as well. So the report talks about the impact of technology used by Canadian police services under Canada's constitution, as well as international human rights obligations that Canada and its government uh, holds more broadly. Um, and so um, examining how these technologies will endanger potentially human rights is also a question of how are these technologies being introduced and what is the current system in which they are being used because that kind of it comes into tension with um, exploring some of the human rights dangers is how is this system currently coping or uh, not coping with uh, human rights protection generally already, even if you were to remove algorithms from the picture. So um, that's where the report comes in, is it's fact finding and, and a legal analysis um, regarding this space. So if we could go to the next slide. We uh, have tried to come up with a uh, framework for defining algorithmic policing technology so that we have a, a framework for understanding what are some of the human rights at stake. So here uh, we've divided algorithmic policing technology into two broad categories. One is um, what's often referred to as predictive policing uh, and the second is algorithmic surveillance uh, and they're both uh, run through algorithmic processing techniques, so in slightly different ways. Under predictive policing, we're talking about the use of an algorithm or algorithmic processing method to analyze large bulk data sets, um, including policing data, such as arrest data, conviction data, pulled together with potentially other sources of data in, in uh, uh, police purview, such as communications data uh, and, and other case analysis and, and case file work product that has been historically collected. Um, and so by analyze, analyzing that data, algorithms are designed uh, with the hope that they might be able to draw patterns from those data sets to predict where uh, crime may happen in the future, it may well not happen, of course, or who may be involved in, in crime in the future. Um, again, it's a very uh, controversial suggestion to talk about future crime that may never even happen, of course. Um, and, and so one of the examples um, that, that listed under the, is the third um, example here, predictive policing is uh, a concept called algorithmic risk assessment. And this is a technology that we know has been rolled out in the United States and in the United Kingdom in pilot projects where um, you're, you're drawing generalized inferences based on 
large statistical patterns in historic data in order to try to predict, for example, if someone who appeals appears in bail court, if they're likely to commit a crime if they are released on bail while they're waiting for their trial. Um, so then the other um, category of algorithmic policing technology is algorithmic surveillance. Uh, and this is a different um, a technology of a different order because what it uses the algorithm to do is to try to uh, collect and, and analyze large data sets in order to monitor and take um, police monitoring to a massive scale. Um, and and it, in some of that uh, data collection and analysis, there's an algorithm or automation uh, tool at work that allows this type of monitoring and data collection to operate automatically. Um, and so some examples listed there are facial recognition systems, social media surveillance and uh, um, automated license plate readers and, and social network analysis. And so we talk about uh, in more detail how Canadian police services in Canada uh, are, are widely using each of these types of algorithmic surveillance programs. Um, they're uh, pu publicly doing so now. Often we've found out after the fact, for example, in the context of facial recognition system, and that's been reported out in media. But um, generally with both of these classes of technology, we've found instances and in, in, uh, uh, what appears to be a growing trend moving towards the experimentation and use of, of both types of uh, algorithmic uh, technologies, including predictive policing. There's uh, programs in Toronto as well as in uh, Saskatchewan that involve predictive policing programs that are already in use. Um, and so if we go to the next slide. Um, so th this is um, really going to show one of the common misconceptions that you might have if you were to say compare some of the technologies that are available at the current stage of technological development to a science fiction movie like Minority Report. And often we hear individuals talking about when they read this report, oh, it sounds like Minority Report. But actually, when we're talking about algorithmic technology, we're talking about a very different type of technology than actually a concrete individual prediction as to when future crime will happen. Rather, um, it, it, it's more useful to think about these technologies as providing a generalized forecast. And, and when you think about statistics generally, they're subject to many different variables, biases, um, inaccuracies that um, statisticians are the, at the first to recognize lead to some problems and reliance on statistical methods to draw concrete predictions. And so when it comes to individual human rights, it's an overarching fact that has to be recognized when we're talking about these technologies in the policing sphere, that they're not um, concrete, specific and reliable, and they haven't been shown to be yet. And there's still a number of uh, researchers calling attention to the need for independent verification of these technologies generally. And so if we could go to the next slide. Um, so when you're thinking about why would an algorithm in policing uh, create a new type of human rights impact compared to previous policing methods. And so some might say, well, if we're talking about a location focused algorithm that's trying to predict where in a city um, a crime might happen, it'd be like putting the little uh, pinpoints on a map and saying, okay, well, there's a lot of pinpoints in this map. So what's wrong with doing this through an algorithm? Is it not just more efficient? Um, but actually when we do a human rights analysis of, of the full context, it really shows how the um, massive scale on which these algorithms can enable policing activities can occur, have significant impacts from a human rights perspective because really changes the order of what in personal interests are at stake and, and um, what kinds of human rights interests are imperiled. So uh, often we hear the discussion when we're talking about big data policing of the three Vs. So when you're talking about, for example, algorithmic surveillance or automated surveillance, um, we're talking about a scale of data collection and analysis that has an unprecedented volume, um, unprecedented speed or velocity, and, it, and the integration 
combination of a variety of different data sources uh, and, and big data uh, sets um, into a, a, a policing activity. Um, and so it, it really changes and, and in some ways um, turns traditional policing methods on their head because what we've always understood and what has always been the case is that generally police services respond to crime or they hope to deter of course but they're they're involved in case specific analysis and evidence collection in the wake of uh, a criminal complaint a bank robbery whatever the case may be you're building evidence on a case file when we're talking about big data we're talking about the surveillance and monitoring of large sectors of Canadian space and, and individuals living in Canada who are not under any under under any investigation and, and there are never going to be because they're not under suspicion of any wrongdoing. Um, and so it, it, it very much changes the um, what's at stake in, in significant ways. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, one of the first areas uh, that's covered in our report is the right to privacy. And, and I want to talk about that for a few minutes because it's an important impact by this technology, but it's also really important when we're talking about algorithmic technology and policing to recognize that privacy is not the only issue. And, and it's quite easy, and I think in, in our minds we would intuitively make a connection between algorithmic surveillance and privacy, but um, sometimes the way that these technologies are being rolled out raises a, a number of interconnected uh, questions that relate to multiple human rights in the same interaction and and you really have a difficult uh difficulty trying to tease them out and, and pull them apart because they're so bound up and related and so some of that will come through and we're talking about the individual rights um and and so if we could go to the next slide um generally when we're thinking about privacy um there, there's been a trend historically to think about uh, privacy as secrecy, and, and that's something that we would uh, like intuitively understand. It's not appropriate under the Constitution for the police to walk into our homes. It's a, it's a private space where the public is not invited and, and there's a, a privacy interest at stake there. But the courts have also moved away in, in significant ways from this limited conception of privacy. And we really think about the idea of privacy as freedom in society. And it's a, it's a concept that's related to other fundamental freedoms like the freedom of expression and the freedom of association. Because when we're, we're trying to understand what the purpose of privacy rights are, we're talking about creating a zone of expression where we can live in freedom in a free and democratic society and where we don't participate in public life in a way where we expect our relative anonymity to be extinguished by bulk data collection and monitoring by the police. For example, if I if I have a, a public facing Twitter account, I don't actually expect that there's a police service out there that's building a case file on me just because I put information onto a public sphere doesn't mean that we have to accept um, the feeling of being watched in, in public life and to have our, our anonymity in those spaces be extinguished by intrusive technologies. And so that's generally speaking why these algorithms uh, tend to have privacy impacts. And when you talk about the legality of a, a police activity, if it has a privacy impact, that's the barometer for whether or not the activity is, is unconstitutional without getting prior authorization from a judge. Uh, and, and so it, it becomes very difficult in, in the current Canadian legal system because we've generally understood that when we're talking about um, individual cases being processed for analysis, that the police can no problem go to the court and get a warrant if they reach a stage in their investigation where they, they're going to intrude into a private space and it's reasonable to do so because there's going to be evidence probably found in it. When we talk about evidence collection on such a scale as automated algorithmic techniques, um, it, it really changes the nature of the game entirely. Um, and also there's other types of impacts that are created in just simply the collection of information. Um, and, and so when we're talking about data processing, use and analysis, we're now seeing uses of information that police services already have and repurposing that information to 
to new ends. And that really changes the nature of the privacy interests at stake and shows how our current regulatory environment is um, ill-equipped to keep, keep up to this type of uh, sphere because um, it, it's really like changing the rules halfway through the game. So for example, we, we, we've always understood that police services collect a database of mugshots of individuals who have been arrested. Individuals who've been arrested and let go and, 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 and they've been found to be innocent. Some of those images are still in, in a mugshot database, for example. Um, and, and now we have police services asserting a right to be able to uh, process these images through facial recognition. Uh, we also see a concurrent rolling out of more and more video CCTV surveillance in urban environments. And so the collection of video of evidence at one point may have been less controversial than it is now when we have facial recognition available. Um, the third area in which we, we see new privacy impacts being created through algorithmic techniques is disclosure and sharing. And, and so when we talk about open government and other kinds of data sharing within government, it creates a host of new questions that are, are very much um, uh, have not yet been answered by the Canadian legal system and there's not a clear path forward as to why this uh, a certain level of data sharing with police services is, could be uh, constitutional at all uh, and so that's something that is very much a, a large problem on the horizon and, and it, it's uh, clearly before us with the use of these technologies. I've, I've talked to my co-panelists about these issues at length and, and we could spend a whole hour talking about that alone, but it's, it's a significant dimension to the problem. And so um, generally speaking, when we look at all of these potential privacy impacts, um, as I said before, one of the key questions in looking at whether or not uh, a privacy impacting police technique is legal is was there permission from an independent oversight body in the form of a judge um, and our current legal system doesn't provide a mechanisms for oversight for some of these types of police techniques and that doesn't mean that they don't need to be obtained but it means that that's not ordinarily how police services are considering themselves uh, to, to need to be apply, uh, complying with the constitution. For example, um, if a police database has a bunch of mug shots in it, um, is there a question as to whether or not a warrant needs to be obtained before running a facial recognition search? Um, ordinarily, you'd think that a warrant happens only when you're talking about going into someone's home. Does it apply to what police services can do to their within the sphere of their own computer, for example? So we've called attention to the need for more oversight to it's actually co coherently aligned with the privacy interests that are at stake through these technologies. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the second space that's very much related to privacy is rights under the constitution and under international human rights law, the uh, freedom of expression, assembly and association. Um, and, and this is, uh, as I said, related to privacy because when we're talking about uh, techniques like social media surveillance or uh, uh, video monitoring and facial recognition monitoring of public uh, spaces like protests or, or, or really any public space at all, the tracking of individual movements in their cars through automated license plate readers, all of these things have a, an impact not only on our privacy, but also the, an impact on individuals who are particularly um, in need of protection under freedoms of expression and assembly and association because they're quality seeking groups. And they depend even more so than the average member of the public on expressive activity in the, for the purposes of a quality seeking activity like protest and public speech. So if we could, Turn to the next slide. Um, the, the, these are pr providing some quotes about some of the findings that journalists that we uh, that have covered these issues have have reached about social media surveillance, um, particularly in, involving the RCMP um, through a project called Project Wide Awake, um, where it's relying on automated surveillance to monitor and, and collect data from social media platforms. Uh, there's also related. Um, known cases in, involving cities in, in Canada, uh, no, notably uh, Toronto and, and Calgary involving a, another technology known as media sonar, uh, where they previously used these techno this technology or uh, 
tech service to monitor uh, protest related hashtags in a social media environment, including Black Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter hashtag. Um, and so when we talk about um, the freedom of expression and association, for example, what we do know in a basic sense is that if, if a government operates in a way that has a chilling effect on the expressive activity at stake, that rep represents a violation. Um, but this is one of the areas that we've identified in a report where the law in Canada is underdeveloped. And because it really shows a collective action problem when it comes to the human rights at stake. And that, uh, for example, there was a case a number of years ago uh, brought by the CCLA where they tried to show how the use of a, a very large sound deterrent at, at a public protest was having a, a, a chilling effect on individual willingness to attend and participate in the protest. And the court struggled with the claim because they said, well, you don't have evidence it, um, to show a, a link between the police services use of this sonic boom as a deterrent to having people willing or fearful to participate in the activity. And that absence of evidence meant that there wasn't an ability to enforce the right to uh, the freedom of expression and participation in a public protest. And so what, what we have highlighted in our report is that there is a growing body of research that shows how the police um, monitoring and surveillance of social media does in fact have a, a, a demonstrable effect on uh, expressive activity in a social media environment. And we've cited to that in our report. And so when we think about what needs to happen in terms of uh, protection of these rights, um, it, it, we've called for proactive compliance by the police services to not engage in activity that does have this chilling effect on social media environments. And so when we have a system that's largely ill-equipped to enforce rights, the need for proactive compliance is that much more important. Uh, and, and we've seen some of, for example, the, the impacts, like anecdotally, in an, this year when the uh, protests relating to Black Lives Matter were um, un, unfolding in the, in the recent months, um, there, there was activity in, in the social media space that um, because there has been this historic knowledge that Toronto Police Service has engaged in the targeting of Black Lives Movement, it made it very difficult for organizers to um, have enhanced public participation in the protests because there was activities happening that led individuals to feel that there were lists being created of individuals who are willing to participate in the protests and complete ambiguity as to why that was the case. And so you see this chilling effect and, and it, it, the, the, the use of these technologies is, is um, one of the sources of this growing and concerning problem. We can go to the next slide. Uh, and, and, and this is a similar um, a, an example of a similar issue relating to expressive activity is that facial recognition in addition to social media surveillance has a similar impact in that your ability to attend at a public protest with freedom that you will have relative anonymity by individuals who are not able to recognize you is undermined by the, the indiscriminate use potentially of, of facial recognition if images are obtained at that protest. And if we go to the next slide. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague to talk about the next subjects. Um, all right, thanks, Kate, and thanks everyone who's here today. I'm gonna to try and zip through my sections so we can get to Yolanda. Um, so I'll be discussing the threat that algorithmic policing poses to the right to liberty and the right to equality. So to begin with, our right to liberty is protected by Section 9 of the Canadian Charter, as well as under multiple international human rights instruments. This means that in theory, law enforcement should not be able to randomly stop us in the streets for no reason, and not without any reasonable grounds to suspect or believe that we've committed or are committing a crime. Um, algorithmic policing can reduce our enjoyment of this right as we walk through the public um, in a few different ways. And I think that's best illustrated through the specific form of technology known as location-based algorithmic policing. The example we have of this type of algorithmic policing is from the Vancouver Police Department. They call it their Geodash um, crime system, which is integrated with a machine learning algorithm. It comprises a system that will predict the top six neighborhoods um, in any two hours where the algorithm thinks that a break and enter is likely to happen throughout the day. Training data is used 
based on crime, type of crime, i.e. break and enters, um, location, date, and time. And it's based solely on crime reported by members of the public. So they purposely excise police initiated data to avoid both um, the risk and the perception of police bias. So some people consider location-based algorithmic policing has as having less dangerous implications for human rights because the data involved, it's, it's the four data points I mentioned earlier, it's crime, neighborhood, date, and time. And so there's nothing specific to an individual there. We're not looking at your family or your school grades or your arrest records. Um, but in the case of our right to liberty, that's actually precisely the problem because under Section 9 law, individuals are detained arbitrarily and thus unconstitutionally um, if they're detained without grounds for reasonable suspicion that are specific to their personal behavior and characteristics. So detaining someone on the basis of generalized suspicion about the area they're in wouldn't be considered reasonable or constitutional. Location-based algorithmic policing, by definition, is based on statistical trends and generalized inferences about a neighborhood that's completely unrelated to any specific individual who happens to be walking through that neighborhood at a time a police officer happened to be sent there. So even assuming that algorithmic forecasts were based on reliable, accurate, and unbiased algorithms, which themselves assume to be trained on reliable, accurate, and unbiased data, um, which are already highly questionable assumptions, the forecast might still be applied by officers in a way that um, violates the constitutional right to liberty. Andrew Ferguson, who's a leading predictive policing scholar in the United States, demonstrates this really clearly by using an A-B type scenario. So in scene A, someone's running down the street with a backpack and it could be because they're late for school or they're late to meet a friend. But say in scene B, the same thing happens, but an officer is sent to that neighborhood informed with the fact that an algorithm has predicted a break and enter is about to happen there at the time that they're there. So in both scenarios, nothing changed about this person running down the street with a backpack. But now with the algorithm, the officer might see them and think, oh, they must be a thief running away with something they just stole. That difference wasn't about that person. The person wasn't doing anything different, but in one case, they weren't detained or arrested or suspected of robbery. Um, in the latter case, they are. So that violates the principle that reasonable suspicion is based on the individual. Second, assuming that you get over the generalized suspicion hurdle, maybe the individual does have specific characteristics or they are, are acting in a way that seems suspicious, the presence of the algorithmic forecast is still uh, liable to distort the formation of reasonable suspicion in the first place. And that's because reasonable suspicion isn't just based on one thing. It's based on a combination of factors that the officer thinks makes that person suspicious. So um, the legal term for it is totality of the circumstances. And it can be challenging to tease out exactly what factors an officer did or didn't rely on in forming their suspicion. So with that in mind, automation bias is a widely documented phenomenon which refers to the tendency of humans to rely on the judgments of technology even if they know that the technology is flawed. So it's very possible that an officer in the street may subconsciously rely on that algorithmic forecast to form their suspicions even if they're trained not to and even if they're intellectually aware they shouldn't. In this case, that algorithmic forecast would be almost like a booster shot tipping over the totality of the circumstances from a situation where that person isn't considered suspicious to one where suddenly they are based on the algorithm alone. The likely result that we think we would expect to happen is that there are just more unconstitutional stops, arrests, and detentions that will happen throughout the country over time because these might be later found to be unconstitutional by a court, but by then it's too late, the damage has already been done, or the court may actually still find them constitutional because judges are themselves humans and are also susceptible to automation bias. The third and final issue um, is reasonable suspicion is unconstitutional if it's based on discriminatory inferences or immutable characteristics such as race. And so we all know that overt racial profiling is unconstitutional. However, a more subtle form of racial profiling can be embedded into algorithmic forecasts themselves. This is a dynamic known as math washing due to the algorithms being trained on police data and therefore reflecting the systemic discrimination that already exists in Canada's criminal justice system. But now that's hidden behind an algorithmic shield of neutrality, so you don't realize that's actually what's going on. So 
those are the problems with the right to liberty. Um, if the main issue, though, is generalized suspicion, then some people might ask, well, OK, what if we don't make it generalized? What if we customize the algorithm to individual people? And we do look at their family, their school history, their arrest records, police interactions, um, social media activity. Well, we actually have people doing that, too. Um, so the Saskatchewan Police Predictive Analytics Lab is engaged in a form of person-based algorithmic policing, which takes information about specific individuals to try to predict the risk, um, in this case, with their missing persons project of becoming a victim. But eventually in the future, they've already said they want to try predicting repeat offenders or violent offenders, for example. And when it comes to predicting what people are going to do based on their personal characteristics and their lives, um, that makes us run straight into the right to equality and freedom from discrimination. So this right is protected under Section 15 of the Canadian Charter and also under international human rights law. There are two things to keep in mind at the outset when it comes to applying an equality analysis to any situation. The first is the idea that an equality analysis must be intersectional. This is a concept created by a Black feminist scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, and it's the idea that if someone has multiple intersecting social identities that are marginalized, you can't separate them out from each other. So someone who is both Black and female, for example, is going to experience layers of oppression that someone who is a, a white female or a black man won't experience, for example. And so you, you can't separate out, you can't say, well, I'm experiencing this, you're experiencing this discrimination because you're black and this because you're a woman, they're intersecting. And so an equality analysis can't be cut up and siloed. The second thing is that equality has to be substantive. So you can't apply a rule neutrally as if we're all on level ground because that's not the case. We're, we're all on a hill or we're on the staircase. And so the idea of substantive equality is you treat different people according to their differences so that the end result is equality. So equality has to be both intersectional and substantive. With that said, algorithmic policing technologies risk violating our constitutional right to equality in three, at least three ways, which I'll go over now. Um, the first is that algorithmic bias based on discriminatory data can unjustly increase already heightened suspicion and aggression with respect to members of marginalized communities, uh, particularly black communities and indigenous peoples, which then of course just exacerbates pre-existing discrimination that we know through Canadian history and through the Canadian criminal justice system. This both reduces the protection and the benefit of the law to which we all should be entitled to under the charter and can result in self-fulfilling prophecies in terms of the people who are predicted to become criminals are then legally marked as criminals even if they haven't actually done anything. So you might end up in a police database due to biased data and because you're now in that database you're that much more likely to come up again in future searches when they're looking for a suspect for something. So algorithmic policing results in what Virginia Eubanks calls feedback loops of injustice. Targeting members of community, marginalized communities ensures that they will only be put forward as targets again and more often in the future. And attempts to use non-sensitive data doesn't really work um, because of the proxy data problem, which is the idea that seemingly innocuous data like shopping history or zip code, for example, we know is statistically tied to protected characteristics such as gender and race. Second, discrimination can also occur based on socioeconomic status, such as income level, homelessness, um, and the degree to which someone relies on government services and social welfare. This is because, again, as Eerbanks lays out in her book, Automating Inequality, people are often required to give up massive amounts of personal data in exchange for these services. And it's things like housing and food stamps, which you need for survival. So you don't really have a choice about preserving your privacy and, and not accessing those services. So people who are already socially and economically disadvantaged um, may be more visible to law enforcement first physically, because if you don't have a home and you're not allowed to exist in indoor spaces, then you're going to be out in public to be physically more visible in the first place. Um, they're made even more visible to police through their data being more ubiquitous in government databases across all the different agencies that they have to obtain services from, which then have links to law enforcement through something like the hub model. Um, as Sarah Brain says in this quote on the slide here, the retroactive nature of policing in an era of dragnet data collection means information is routinely accumulated and files are lying in wait. In that sense, individuals who live in poverty or who are homeless or racialized lead incriminating lives. And I think it's really important to emphasize once again that this is all in the event of, of predicting, quote unquote, predicting crime. Um, in the context of pre-crime and same thing with the surveillance, nothing has happened yet. Everything we're talking about 
no crime has happened. It's not as if something has happened and this is an ongoing investigation. These are all preemptive measures uh, deployed on people in situations where crime may, may never happen. And that's one of the reasons that it's, it's really uh, such a source of concern as well. And finally, is the issue of inequality by design, where algorithmic policing technologies may not only further encode inequality and discrimination into the fabric of the criminal justice system more so than they already are, but they also mask this injustice by virtue of their very reliance on algorithms and that mystique where they, it allows them to take on a veneer of scientific and mathematical objectivity or infallibility. This can lead to what's known as techno-solutionism, or the idea that problems, let alone complex socio-political ones, can be reductively solved by technology alone. As a result, algorithmic policing technologies may uh, end up being a, a double threat. First, they don't actually solve the underlying problems of community safety. And we see this discussion coming up in current conversations around police defunding and police abolition, for example. But beyond that, they might do worse by sucking up all the funding and attention and resources that might go directly towards solving those root causes, such as poverty, income inequality, affordable housing, um, healthcare, and systemic racism. And all of those are not technology problems. They're problems of political will, um, which is something an algorithm is just not going to solve. Um, so with that, I will pass you over to Yolanda. Hi, everybody. Um, so, I mean, as Kate and Cynthia have gone over, we've obviously identified a number of areas of concern uh, with respect to, you know, our constitutional and international human law, uh, rights law standards and the uh, use of algorithmic policing technologies. And um, in our report, what we've done is we've come up with 20 recommendations, um, seven of which we've identified as priority recommendations that require uh, urgent action from policymakers, from governments, and from law enforcement agencies. And, you know, driving our, our recommendations are sort of three motivations. The first is that um, there needs to be a prohibition or a moratorium on the use on, on certain uses of algorithmic policing technologies that we know at this moment are not acceptable under human rights uh, and constitutional law standards. So, for example, um, you know, police, police cannot have under our laws an unchecked and unlimited authority to use algorithmic um, policing technologies in, in public spaces. Uh, there's also a requirement under international human rights law that any kinds of applications of these technologies need to meet the standards, which are quite strict, of reliability, necessity, and proportionality. Um, this leads me to, though, to our second kind of driving force between the recommendations, which is that there's a, there, as, as Kate has mentioned, and as Cynthia have, has mentioned, there is a gap in the regulatory environment and in our Canadian laws um, with, with respect to how equipped courts are at this current moment, uh, how equipped the jurisprudence is to handle the kinds of technologies that we've seen coming out. And for this reason, we are calling on law enforcement agencies and governments to uh, enforce a moratorium on um, the use of algorithmic policing technologies until there can be a full inquiry into these technologies um, in order to establish a constitutional and international human rights respecting framework that can be enforced from the outset. Um, so before these technologies become uh, you know, widespreadly adopted, before their use is ingrained in the way that Canadian police services um, carry out their policing activities. And uh, you know, as part of this, we've talked a little bit about what uses can be made of um, historic police data sets given the concerns that they raise for privacy and for equality. Um, and one of our specific recommendations is for a judicial inquiry to specifically look into this, to examine and to really um, reflect on, uh, you know, how do we use all of this data that's been collected in the past that we know is subject to various forms of bias. As Cynthia mentioned, there is an issue of hypervisibility among um, among populations that are uh, targeted by police and have been targeted by police. Um, and finally, 
our, the third kind of driving force behind our recommendations is that there's a need for immediate and full transparency and accountability by law enforcement agencies uh, with respect to what technologies they're using right now, what they're developing, and what they might be procuring. Um, this is related to a couple of other rights that we haven't you know, had the time to go into detail here, but we do go into detail to in the report, which are uh, the right to due process and the right to a remedy. So, you know, one of the main issues that we've come across and that researchers across the world have come across when it comes to um, trying to figure out exactly what's going on with algorithmic policing is that there is a huge amount of secrecy. The secrecy comes from, uh, you know, a variety of sources. It comes from the private vendors who uh, often are the ones who are developing these technologies and selling them to law enforcement agencies um, who can, you know, they can raise issues of uh, intellectual property and um, can use that or can use that to sort of block the, the disclosure of exactly how these algorithmic technologies are working to the public or to civil society or to experts um, or even to the police themselves. And then secondly, what we found in our research is that there is, uh, you know, a, what I would call a shocking uh, resistance to disclose it, to disclosure from the police services themselves. Uh, as part of our research and as part of our fact finding, we filed a number of FOI uh, freedom of information requests to police services and to governments, and were met with a, a you know fairly disappointing results. I'll say, um, law enforcement agencies under our freedom of information laws have certain exemptions that they routinely use. Uh, I would say probably too broadly um, to, you know, to resist disclosure of uh, the kinds of tools that they use in their investigations. Um, they also have certain privileges, so uh, you know, legal privileges such as solicitor client privilege or things like that that they've used to again to resist disclosure. And um, and finally, and this is you know a problem with our freedom of information laws more generally is that there's uh, there's issues with delays, there is, there's issues with the, just the sort of, uh, I'll say the antiquity of the system in terms of how information is transmitted and um, issues with the costs that are associated. So, you know, although this is supposed to be uh, something that's publicly accessible and anybody can really make a freedom of information request if it's relating to general information that's not personally, that doesn't contain personal identifiers, um, we were, you know, met with pretty exorbitant fees uh, for for trying to get uh, information. So, I mean, in this kind of context of opacity and of um, the inaccessibility of information, some of our key recommendations are that uh, you know law enforcement make full disclosure about what systems are currently in place or what they're looking to obtain to the public and to privacy commissioners. And um, our recommendations also include uh, recommendations to provinces, to governments, to um, enforce mandatory uh, disclosure requirements um, through, through provincial directives to police services. And um, you know, apart from you know, having to do this research in order to be able to identify what's going on and exactly what human rights abuses might be, might be happening, it, it has serious implications for the rights of people who are, um, you know, who might be targeted or charged with uh, offenses as a result of the use of algorithmic policing systems. You know, your right to a due process guarantees that you, uh, if charged, have the right to make full answer in defense to the charges that you're faced with. If um, a, an accused person or their counsel can't figure out exactly how an algorithmic policing system works, um, if they're blocked by, uh, you know, by 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 private interest in the in the in in protecting their intellectual property, then that that has serious implications for um, your ability to properly challenge something that uh, you know is is contributing towards your ongoing detention and um, and charge. And then even, even individuals who are, are not charged, you know, who might be wrongfully identified by certain algorithmic policing technologies, 
might eventually have their charges dropped, who, um, or, you know, who are just generally subject to surveillance without, uh, you know, without charges being advanced them ever. Under international human rights law ought to have a right to a remedy for any violations to their privacy um, or to their fundamental freedoms, as Kate touched on. And these are also things that obviously require um, a much higher level of transparency from our law enforcement agencies and from our province, our governments. Um, in order for, for the right to remedy to be effective and, um, or really to exist at all. So if you can go to the next slide, Cynthia. So just given, I think we want to leave like sufficient time for Q&A, so I'm not necessarily going to walk through these recommendations one by one, but um, as I said, we have seven priority recommendations, which are listed here. Um, and uh, there's a full set of 20 in the report. If you're interested, I would uh, recommend going through that. It's, it's quite a detailed analysis of them. And uh, you know, we're proud of them and we stand by them. 